All right. So good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our September of 2021 Global One Health Initiative a special world rabies webinar supported by the NIH Fogarty International Center. And today I will briefly discuss some of the work that we as GoHi have done with rabies in Ethiopia. And our primary speakers will be Dr. Chiprina from the University of Glasgow College of Medical, Veterinary and Life Sciences in Scotland, who is based in Tanzania and Kennedy Lushasi of the Ifakara Health Institute, also in Tanzania. And so I'd like to go ahead and start with a brief introduction uh, to introduce um, Dr. Chiprina and Kennedy before I begin. So Dr. Anna Chiprina is a postdoctoral researcher working in Tanzania and coordinating field research activities for the Rabies Elimination Project. And she received her PhD from the University of Illinois at Chicago, studying domestic dog population dynamics in villages near Serengeti National Park. Her dissertation research titled The Ecology of Free Roaming Domestic Dogs in Rural Villages Near Serengeti National Park involved an innovative multidisciplinary approach that integrated demography, endocrinology, and public health, so very one health. She has and continues to carry out high impact work in the field, leading Tanzania towards rabies elimination. And then Kennedy Lushasi is a research scientist at the Ifakara Health Institute in Tanzania, and is also an Africa One Aspire PhD student in his final year. He has over 10 years of experience working with rabies epidemiology, prevention, and control, and has been liaising with both healthcare workers and veterinarians to organize, implement, and evaluate mass dog vaccination programs, overseeing rabies surveillance work across Southern and Northern Tanzania. And Kennedy is currently leading a pilot study on integrated bite case management which is an approach for rabies control that links human health and veterinary sectors in the fight against rabies. He also leads the public engagement component of the rabies control activities in Pemba Island, Tanzania, where he works with community members, human and animal health practitioners and policymakers to understand how they have been impacted by rabies and what they can do to prevent rabies um, from their societies through storytelling. So with that, I will go ahead and begin my brief presentation on rabies specific work uh, in Gohai, with Gohai um, focused in Ethiopia. So one minute while I change my screen. All right. Mm -hmm. Bear with me here as I get my screen up. Does everyone see my PowerPoint presentation? Or is it? Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. So, um, my name is Laura Binkley. I'm a postdoctoral researcher with the Global One Health Initiative. And um, my PhD work was largely focused on rabies, so it's very special to me. Um, so I'd like to start off by presenting some facts about rabies. So rabies is a disease caused by an RNA virus from the family Rhabdoviridae in genus Lysivirus, and it causes fatal encephalomyelitis once it reaches the brain in all mammals. It also has the highest human case fatality proportion of any infectious disease. However, mortality is 100% preventable. Over 95% of human victims are from Africa and Asia, most from marginalized and impoverished rural communities, and about 40% of those cases worldwide are in children. Through other special, or through other special though other species are critical um, for rabies transmission worldwide, 99% of all human rabies cases are the result of an exposure to a dog with rabies. 
Vaccination of 70% of dogs in at-risk areas can eliminate canine rabies. So mass vaccination has really proven to be an effective method throughout the world. Therefore, we really must vaccinate to reach the global goal to end human deaths from dog needed rabies by 2030. And this goal was established as part of the global framework for the elimination of dog mediated human rabies, which was established in 2016 through joint efforts among the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World, Ag World Organization for Animal Health, and the Global Alliance for Rabies Control. So to give you a brief overview of the framework, the framework has um, for dog, it's for dog unlimited or dog mediated human rabies. It revolves around five major pillars that can be abbreviated as STOP R. The S stands for sociocultural and refers to influences on rabies perceptions throughout communities. T stands for technical and includes activities related to vaccination, logistics, diagnostics, and surveillance. The O stands for organization and includes activities related to promotion and coordination of one, the One Health concept. P stands for political and includes activities related to international support, legal frameworks, and regional engagement. And R stands for resources and includes the activities related to establishing sustainable funding streams, supplies, and equipment. So the blueprint for rabies uh, prevention and control is a document that serves as a toolkit for countries to really apply this framework to develop their own national programs with local context. And then the stepwise approach towards rabies elimination, or SARI, is one of the tools provided in the blueprint. And this tool provides measurable steps shown as a logical flow of activities to progress from stage zero to stage five in an effort to reach freedom from dog-mediated rabies transmission. So countries with no information on rabies start at stage zero, while those that reach stage five are considered free from dog-mediated rabies transmission. And within each step, there are several criteria that must exist in order to advance to the next stage. So as part of the Ohio State University Global One Health Initiative, or GOHI, we have been working in Ethiopia to apply the stepwise approach to rabies prevention and control formally since 2013, but starting many years before that. Ethiopia is not only one of the largest countries in Africa, but has also long been one of the most rabies affected countries in the world. So skipping over stage zero, which is no data, I will move into stage one, which is the assessment stage. And this includes establishing elements of assessment regarding local rabies epidemiology and development of a short-term rabies action plan. It applies the sociocultural, organizational, and political pillars of the global framework. So OSU GoHai has helped guide the assessment phase with collaborators in Ethiopia through numerous activities some of which include the development of an expert mental model in 2013, focusing on key aspects necessary for rabies prevention and control. And then the subsequent development of a rabies knowledge attitudes and practices or a KAP survey tool based on the expert mental model that was then conducted in Gondar, Ethiopia by both Ohio State University and University of Gondar students working together to interview 293 individuals from five core community groups. And I was proud to be a part of that. Um, and then we've also collaboratively hosted a two-day stakeholder focus forward workshop, including professionals working at various relevant Ethiopian government institutes, students in academia um, and in faculty, pharmacy representatives and nonprofits, um, organizations to really share prior work on rabies in Ethiopia, discuss the results of the KAP assessment findings, and then identify key priority areas um, to then develop a One Health Rabies a pilot control project. 
So the workshop really focused on four major aspects, including surveillance and monitoring, prevention and control in humans, prevention and control in animals, and education and advocacy. And this included topics such as reporting existing prevention and control systems in both animals and humans, existing health infrastructure, legislation, guidelines, and capacity in both veterinary and public health sectors. Um, one of the major results of this workshop was the development of a draft action plan for Ethiopia that was called the Ethiopian Rabies Roadmap for Rabies Prevention and Control. And the roadmap included or um, establishment of these working groups for each of the four major focus areas. Other activities include engaging business professionals to carry out business supply chain and market assessments that helped identify the logistical details and gaps needed for the implementation of the broader recommendations in the roadmap draft, carrying out focus group surveys to determine canine population dynamics, ownership, vaccination, and registration status, as well as rabies associated costs. And through our CDC funded global health security agenda cooperative projects beginning in 2016, many assessments have been and continue to be carried out, including assessments of lab, di lab diagnostic capacity, surveillance and reporting structures, quarantine centers, field methods, local supply chains, owner preferences for vaccine delivery, and dog transit surveys to estimate the dog population in the city of Gondor. The next phase is the strategic planning phase where improved epidemiological understanding and knowledge about the prevailing institutional landscape are applied to generating a national action plan. And in 2017, the OSU team attended two stakeholder right shops for the National Rabies Prevention and Control Strategy. The Rabies Roadmap served as the backbone for the national strategy. So we really take a great deal of pride in that. Um, and this included various standard operating procedures established by OSU, such as those for managing mass vaccination clinics. And stage three is the control stage. And this is really where Ethiopia currently resides on the stepwise scale. At this phase, rabies is still endemic and the national rabies control strategy is working to be implemented. And our work in this phase touches on all five pillars of the global framework. And in general, control methods are centered around several critical areas, including dog vaccination, dog population control, surveillance, human behavioral modification, and post-exposure prophylaxis treatment, which I'll leave out of this presentation today. So OSU has played a significant role here, especially through the global health security agenda activities related to workforce development. And for most trainings in workforce development, we apply a training of trainers model where we first train a cater of master trainers and then go on to lead, who then go on to lead their own trainings, thus creating this pool of competent instructors who can then teach the material to other people instead of relying on a single trainer to teach the material over an extended period of time. And we have trained more than a and surrounding areas. And then since 2016, Ohio State Go Ohio has carried out two additional major mass vaccination training campaigns, the first lasting for two weeks and the second lasting for six weeks. Our unique approach includes a combination of didactic coursework, dry lab training, and field training. And another unique attribute of our approach is that we provide field training for vaccination of the free roaming dog population, which is one of the most difficult populations to vaccinate. And we have also worked to produce, um, procure supplies, providing trainees with max vaccination kits, which you can see here, and working to identify local supplies to create control poles for the safe and humane capture of dogs. 
And we even created prov provided guidelines and trainings for control pole production locally. So though our, uh, through our work with the global health security agenda, we were able to vaccinate over 62,328 dogs and cats throughout Ethiopia and work still continues. Rabies surveillance is another area where we've made a significant impact. Our team has carried out three major rabies surveillance trainings in Ethiopia, each lasting between one and two weeks. The trainings cover topics such as integrated vice case, case management, uh, which Kennedy will be discussing as well, I believe, reporting, evaluation for quarantine or testing, safe dog capture and handling, humane euthanasia, and preparation and packaging of samples for lab delivery, among other topics. And methods include both the didactic and the dry lab training, and participants demonstrated technical skills through a test created by our team called the Objective Standardized Clinical Evaluation, or OSCE. We also developed permanent curriculum, including PowerPoint presentations, instructional videos, lab guides, and necessary assessment material. This training was able to successfully train professionals from both the Ministry of Health as well as the Ministry of Agriculture side by side, thus facilitating the cross-sectoral collaboration that is really essential for rabies elimination in all One Health efforts. And in addition to the surveillance training, we also worked with the Ethiopian Public Health Institute to operationalize and implement an integrated bite reporting surveillance system that is currently up and running in Addis Ababa, and we hope to spread throughout the rest of the country. Prior to the Global Health Security Agenda work, our lead rabies expert, Dr. Jeanette O'Quinn, who is really the leader in all of these initiatives, carried out a spay and neuter training in Gondor, consisting of a series of lectures and practical surgery labs offered to local veterinarians covering all aspects of spay and neuter, including anesthesia, surgery, and recovery. And this training brought in veterinarians from all across the country, some of whom were eventually hired by the University of Gondor afterwards to continue to carry out spay and neuter. It also really taught trainees how to teach surgery, which is something that in many cases is not necessarily taught. And we've also done a great deal of work relating to community awareness, education, and behavioral modification. In 2017, OSU worked with partners in Ethiopia to create awareness materials, which were then field tested by interviewing um, those who came into clinics and carrying out focus groups or focus group surveys at local schools. And we also recently developed and released a 45 minute rabies documentary, as well as a five minute poem slash public service announcement announcement with Walta Media, which is one of the largest media companies in Ethiopia, both of which have been nationally aired on multiple occasions. So we're very happy about that. And our team continues to advocate for and advise policymakers on rabies control and prevention strategies, serving on the National One Health Steering Committee, as well as the National Rabies Technical Working Group. And then lastly, with the help of applied research and research implementation, we really hope to be able to move Ethiopia into the next phase of the stepwise approach, which is elimination. We somewhat recently carried out a project examining brain samples from 228 wild and domestic animals collected in five Ethiopian regions from 2010 through 2017 to identify variants circulating throughout the country. And our results identified co-circulating rabies virus lineages that are causing recurrent spillover infections into both wild and domestic animal populations. We did not find any evidence of importation of rabies viruses from other African countries or vaccine-induced cases, but we did identify a divergent rabies virus lineage that might be involved in an independent rabies cycle in side-striped jackal populations. We also carried out a study looking at intra and interspecies contact rates between and among carnivore species, scavenging at slaughter plant facilities using camera traps. 
And using this data, we were able to generate models that indicate that spotted hyena populations may play a role in rabies maintenance throughout Ethiopia. There's still very little known about rabies and wildlife species throughout Ethiopia, which remains a significant gap in knowledge that will become more significant as control uh, in the dog population continues. Based on local situations, each country will need to adopt the rabies blueprint differently to meet their needs and priorities. Uh, and there are many ways to approach rabies prevention and control, all of which need to be shared in order to determine what does and does not work. And on that note, I would like to hand it over to our speakers working in Tanzania, Dr. Anna Chifrina and Kennedy Lushasi. And um, with that, you may go ahead and share your screen and begin. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I need to, sorry, I just had a power cut. So I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping that my internet will hold up because I'm, all, I'm working off of my phone right now. <laughs> oh, um, let me just, we're all too familiar let with me that. Just no problem. To, let me just go ahead to share my screen. Um, No. Are you able to see my screen or not? It's just about to share. So it looks like it's working on it. There you go. Yep. And do you see the actual, because it's for some reason, I'm not actually able to see what I'm looking, what I'm. <laughs> Are you, do you, uh, do you, are you guys able to see the presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay, it's great. In, um, play mode, but it's there. Okay. And is it in presentation mode right now? For some reason, yep. I don't know why my screen is not pulling up, but anyway. Um, all right. So my name is Anna Trapina and today together with, um, Kennedy Lushasi, we will be sharing with you some of the research that um, and the work that we've been doing on rabies um, here in Tanzania. And, um, and specifically, I'm, I'm just going to do a quick overview about the things that we do here. And Kennedy will follow up on some of the exciting work that he has uh, been working on in Pem on Pemba Island. So, um, you know, as Laura gave us a really good background on rabies, um, you know, the zero by 2030 is a global strategy that was launched by the WHO, OIE, and FAO back in 2018 to eliminate human deaths from rabies. Um, and one of the reasons why rabies, there's, there's lots of reasons why rabies continues to be a challenge, um, even in 2021, um, but just a few things, you know, we have lack of um, consistent and sustainable access to post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, vaccinations for humans, as well as vaccinations for animals, specifically dog access to dog vaccines is not always um, consistent, depending on where you are in the world. Um, you know, and, and, and so there's, there's a lot of things that, that's wrapped into this. Now, um, we're specifically focused on dog, on canine rabies. Um, so anybody that's interested in bat-mediated um, rabies, um, that is, uh, and that's not something that is my specialty or what we work on here. We're predominantly focused on dog rabies because here in Tanzania, um, and in, in, in much of the world, do domestic dogs are actually the main reservoir for rabies. Now, what's really interesting about that is that dog vaccination can control rabies and it will reduce rabies cases in both humans and animals, um, exposures, the demand for expensive post-exposure vaccinations, as well as human rabies deaths. Um, and the global vaccine bank's support for human rabies vaccines may help with this. However, um, in order for Gavi to um, support countries um, with human rabies vaccines, um, countries will need to demonstrate that they are, that they have plans for mass dog vaccination programs or progress in vaccinating dogs in their countries. So 
but right now, as far as the situation in Tanzania, we estimate that there are approximately 1,500 human deaths per year in the country. And of course, this is likely an underestimate as we all know that particularly in rural areas where say access to hospitals and dispensaries may be limited. Um, people may be exposed to rabies and may die of rabies, but may never actually go to a hospital. So the, that case may never get reported. Um, we, based on our research, a pro probably more than 3 million US dollars are spent annually just on post-exposure vaccines. Um, but this does prevent about 2,500 deaths. And what we've seen as well from our survey work is that approximately 25% of probable rabid dog bite victims do not actually seek care. And 20% of the people that are bitten by likely rabid dogs that go actually to hospitals and dispensary to seek care, they actually do not receive um, post-exposure pro prophylaxis because either that clinic or hospital is out of the vaccine, um, or it's just too expensive and it's just cost prohibitive for, cost prohibitive for that person. Um, now, locally here, it's approximately $20, depends on where you are, per vial. Um, and again, the Gavi investment in human um, rabies vaccine may improve this, but it will be contingent upon countries demonstrating that they are making progress with dog vaccination. Um, so our research, our work here in Tanzania, um, we're, we do a couple of different things. In the Northern um, area in Mara region, um, we are conducting systematic dog vaccination for over 20 years. We're currently now in the midst of a scaled up dog vaccination trial that has been going on since late last year, since late 2020, because we had a bit of a hiccup with the pandemic as, a, as many research projects have had. Um, we're also conducting some integrated bite case management in those areas and contact tracing of cases. There are lots of small scale pilot programs, as you can see with the red stars. Um, so these are programs that have been doing vaccination work um, through various organizations with NGOs, student groups, animal welfare organizations. We also have quite a, quite a large body of research going down in southern Tanzania, so that's around um, Morogoro, Lindi, and Tuara region, where there was a large scale dog vaccination trial that ended in 2018, that was part of the Gates project. Um, but it has continued um, on a much smaller scale, but it has continued um, with some, uh, with as well looking at bike, um, integrated bike case management um, and um, implementing the abridged post-exposure prophylaxis um, reg reg regimen. Um, we also have um, some vaccination work and research that is going on on the island of Zanzibar and Pemba, which you'll be hearing about shortly from Kennedy. Now, the methods that we're using, um, first and foremost, the, 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 the main crux of our program is mass dog, vac mass dog rabies vaccination campaigns. So conducting, uh, mass, um, conducting vaccination campaigns um, on an annual basis, um, we predominantly focus on Central Point, although we are piloting some um, smaller scale programs with on-demand uh, vaccina vaccinations uh, with using local rabies coordinators. Um, we're using integrated bike case management um, as a surveillance tool to estimate the number of exposures and cases, um, as well as to understand what the PEP um, needs are in various parts of the country. We're also using whole genome sequencing of suspected rabies samples um, to, in order to determine, you know, where, what does, what do the transmission dynamics look like? And we have a couple of novel um, techniques that we're implementing, such as low-tech cooling devices for storing rabies vaccine and facial recognition. Um, this is one of our most exciting things that we're um, spearheading right now using facial recognition technology to register and identify dogs that are vaccinated. Um, 
Now, integrated bike case, uh, integrated bike case management is, a, is one of the things that we're using from, in order to enhance our surveillance um, to determine really how many cases we have, how many exposures we have. And um, but other than just collecting this data, one of the beautiful things about this is that it brings together all the sectors. Because one of the challenges that, that we know with rabies is that it's one of those diseases that it's like, you know, it, it makes such sense that it's a one health, one health um, issue because you can affect animals and humans, um, domestic animals and wild animals as well, right? But it's very difficult to, de to decide, well, well, who runs what, right? Who takes responsibility for what? Is, it, is this a human doctor situation? Is this a veterinarian situation? Do the animal people, do the human people, who takes, control, who takes charge of collecting these data? But when you integrate looking at bite cases, um, you bring sectors together and you start to collaborate um, and this is one of the things that, um, you know, one, one of the beauties of, of, of rabies, you know, it's a very challenging virus, but it's a virus that can actually bring together um, not just the animal sector, but the human sector as well. And so with integrated bite case management, what we do is we have data that is shared between the veterinary sector, the livestock sector, the laboratory sector, the medical sector, you know, in terms of the human doctors, dispensaries, hospitals, in order to um, most effectively um, guide people toward, uh, specifically, first identify suspected cases. And then secondly, if there is, if there are people or animals that are exposed to rabies, um, that we get them, that we help them get the appropriate treatment and prevention um, for it. Um, again, as I mentioned, most of our work is, fo the, the, you know, the very basis of our work is vaccinating dogs because what we've been able to find um, over the last 20 years of, of conducting work in Tanzania is that as you increase vaccination, so um, this project originated um, around 2001, 2002 with very small scale vaccinations. Um, in a little, little tiny place called Serengeti District, which is just northwest of Serengeti National Park, um, where initially we, we, there was only about two or 3,000 dogs vaccinated per year, and cats too. If cats are brought to us, we, we vaccinate cats as well. But over the years, we've steadily been able to increase the number of animals, dogs and cats that are vaccinated. And what the really cool thing is we've been able to see is that as vaccination increased over time, the um, number of human rabies exposures and animal exposures um, and deaths and cases decreased over time. Um, so, and then this is just a short inversion because if we were to expand this over time, it'd be very, it'd be a little bit difficult to see. Um, but what we've been able just to show just in this one little district is that if we can target all the villages in um, this district, we can essentially eliminate rabies locally. Um, so as vaccination campaigns have improved, rabies cases, both in humans and animals, exposures and deaths have all declined. Um, and it just, this is just a very, very basic summary. You know, for example, in 2012, we were seeing approximately 30 rabid dogs per month. Um, whereas in 2018, after we started systematically really making sure that we targeted every village, um, had a vaccination campaign at least once that year, we were only seeing, we were seeing less than two dogs per month. Um, we went from 20 human exposures per month to less than one. Um, for a total, you know, we used to have um, about 47 um, total human exposures in 2000, we had 47 total human exposures in 2012. We only had one in 2018 and as far as human deaths, and of course deaths varies over time, um, but we went down to zero just in a few short years. Um, so dog vaccination works, but there's a lot of challenges as, as we know, and, 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 you know, and, and Laura um, was talking about a lot of the work that, that has been done in Ethiopia and, these are some of the things that we're, we've also been 
um, examining and trying to understand how can we um, not only understand these problems, but really how can we mitigate them? Um, so we know that dog vaccination works, but what's the problem? You, you have to do, you can't just do dog, you can't just vaccinate 50 dogs today and then, oh, next we'll skip next year. Um, so actually the, some of the research that's coming out right now is, is how rabies has been impacted um, or, th or the lack of rabies, um, rabies research or uh, vaccination, for example, due to the pandemic, how has that impacted um, rabies cases coming back, right? Um, we know that also the, you know, the capacity and getting personnel trained, again, one of the things that Laura mentioned is, you know, you know having vets that are trained, not just vets, but maybe um, local um, lay, lay persons, you know, maybe it's teachers, maybe it's community animal health workers that can vaccinate, but also that can restrain dogs, that can help, um, you know, catch dogs if, if needed. Intersectoral collaboration, again, who takes responsibility for rabies, especially if it, rabies affects everybody, who's going to take responsibility for it? Will it be the medical sector, the veterinary sector, or ideally having um, all those sectors collaborate together? Um, and, you know, awareness about rabies still in, in many rural areas, um, or even in areas where, and in areas, for example, where rabies has been elimin eliminated, if it hasn't been around for a couple of years, what can happen is sometimes people forget. And again, if we don't maintain uh, vaccination rates and if people aren't vigilant about um, reporting bite cases and seeking treatment, we, do, we can see that uh, rabies can come back as well. And funding can also be a challenge, of course. Um, again, one of the things that we're looking at is how do we overcome these, bar these barriers? Um, well, with va vaccines, um, one of, uh, you know, there are vaccines, having available vaccines is challenging, but there are opportunities to kickstart vaccination programs using high quality vaccines. Um, the OIE Vaccine Bank um, can assist with those things. Personnel. Um, in many places, you just don't have access to vets. So, or if there are vets, it's just, it's unavoidable or it's not really feasible that they can actually reach everybody. So, you know, using local volunteers, students, paraprofessionals, there are amazing um, free, free, free is also, also always great. Um, there are amazing training tools, such as the GARC, um, the uh, Global Alliance for Rabies Control, the education platform, where you can train people um, about rabies and then how to educate communities about rabies and identifying signs and vaccination and stuff like that. And so this can really help with um, increasing the reach of campaigns and their efficiency. Campaign costs, right? Finance money, money is always an issue, isn't it? But, um, you know, there are lots of planning tools that are available for estimating costs. Um, and one thing that we've found in our research um, that has come up consistently is that making sure that dog vaccination is free is always the best strategy for effective vaccination. Um, it is difficult because, again, in many of these Again, because rabies is, is, is one of those diseases that in struggling um, or developing areas, it's, it's hard to get funding for. So many times there is this um, like propensity to charge um, dog owners for vaccinations. But what we found is that that really impacts the um, coverage, um, you know, in, in many places where um, people are, you know, living at a subsistence level, it's just not feasible for them to pay. So making sure that dog vaccination is free, um, if you really want to eliminate rabies, is the best strategy. Um, you know, getting dog population estimates in order to forecast your equipment and vaccine needs. This is important, but it should not be a hiccup. What we found is that you can, you can start a vaccination campaign and then use that information to build up moving forward. Timing, again, I cannot stress enough the importance of involving the communities, um, local um, leaders, um, you know, talking to school teachers, kids even, um, 
churches, mosques, and really understanding in these local areas, when are public events? When do school holidays take place? Um, is it harvest season? All of these things can influence how successful a vaccination campaign can be. Um, and monitoring and evaluation, that's one of the things we're focused, we're working on right now with how can we assess vaccination coverage and identify gaps where vaccination delivery or strategy really needs to improve. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of apps that are coming out, like the Mission Rabies app, GARC has an app as well. Um, so there are tools available for this. But again, sometimes people get, sometimes when you, when, in rabies, um, there's, you, you get a lot of stress because, ah, you know, you think you need, you need all this fancy stuff. Sometimes it's as much really as simple as just starting with a paper register and going from there. Um, so again, one of, the, one of the things that we're working on right now is looking at how we can use technology to, um, to, re to really move forward in the global fight against rabies. Um, one of the, again, what we're doing is uh, Gurdeep, who's um, pictured up here in the upper left hand side. She's one of another one of our PhD students who's doing whole genome sequencing of rabies samples. But what's, what we're doing, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take this to the next level so that we can do, um, we can use what, we, what we're calling a lab in a suitcase, which was developed by um, Dr. Kirsten Brunker. Uh, which is a mobile lab actually, so that you can actually do sequencing in real time in the field um, that would be very helpful um, for understanding. Because a lot of times, you know, when you're doing sequencing and things like that, stuff takes time, but you may not have, you really want to understand these dynamics as they're taking place uh, versus, you know, years, months, or years later. We're, we've also tested, uh, field tested, um, uh, basic cooling strategies. So one of the challenges with rabies has been um, and continues to be in many places, you know, there might not be electricity or access to fridges um, in order to store the vaccines. So what we've actually done is we've worked with local um, community members that may have made these clay, um, we've tested, we tested clay, we tested concrete, making these urns um, and filled with water and sand um, and, or, and keeping them to see if we can actually keep the rabies vaccine at a cool enough temperature that it will still be viable and it will still work, um, but without the use of electricity um, so that you know, we can actually roll out vaccination programs um, into places that, again, probably need it a lot more, but may not have access to stable electricity and fridges. And then most recently, the picture on the, on the right side um, is we are, we've, we are field testing. We're now in our sec third, third trial of field testing a facial recognition um, app to basically identify dogs and be able to register them um, so that we can, assess coverage, so how, um, how many dogs we've been able to vaccine, so, uh, vaccinate, to assess vaccination coverage, as well as to be able to determine whether or not a dog was vaccinated. Um, so we're really excited about this and um, stay tuned. We'll, we, we will keep you guys posted on, on how this work continues. We're just about to start our next field trial of this. So um, we have a lot of things going on um, and I've just given a brief overview, but what you can do is we do have a website. Um, you can check us out on the Re Rabies Research Hub um, where we develop this website in order to um, basically interact more and collaborate more with local stakeholders here in Tanzania. However, as we know, rabies is a global issue, right? It's not just Tanzania. So if anybody can, um, if other people can, you know, benefit from our work and from our research, uh, please feel free to visit um, the rabiesresearch.github.io backslash Serengeti um, site, and you can take a look at what, what we've got done. We are, this is, oh, sorry, this is a website that's um, still in process. So uh, we also have collaborators in the Philippines, um, 
that and so we're hoping to add to this so don't mind um as there don't mind if there are some of the tabs are still under construction or are not complete but um as we say here in tanzania karibu sana um so you're most welcome to check it out and i am now going to hand it over to kennedy who will be spotlighting some of his exciting work from pemba island Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anna, so much for your nice presentation. Let me share my screen first. Here. Yes, I, I, I need to stop sharing. So I'm going to stop share and then I think you can go in. <laughs> Now, can you see my screen? Yes, it is. Okay. Yep, I see it. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, I will be taking it. Thanks, Anna. Anna's, Anna, she has tried to summarize the kind of work which we are doing in Tanzania. We are implementing rabies control across northern and southern Tanzania, as you saw on her map, but also we, we are also working on Pemba Island. For this presentation, I will focus on Pemba. I will just focus on Pemba to highlight the success stories which we have gone through. And uh, this time, I think it's very important to, because the global target now is to have zero human death by 2030. And uh, there are so many interventions which are going on. Sorry, I'm skipping the introductions which the first year presenter and the second already presented. I will just give it, I will just start from here. So as we have this global target of zero human death by 2030, it's now very important to show examples where rabies elimination has been achieved. So our target is by 2030. If it happened that there are some places on the continent, if it's in either Africa or Asia, where rabies has been eliminated, so this is the right time to to shout out, to give it out to the world that, okay, we have been able to achieve the goal before the search timeline, but there are other things which need to be done. There are several programs which are ongoing, mass local vaccination, and also making sure that we have post-exposure prophylaxis for these bite victims. But one of the challenges, as the, you mentioned, is the surveillance to quantify these impacts of mass local vaccinations is still limited in most of the places. And uh, it's the reason why we started implementing the integrated bite case management, hoping it will help to quantify the public health impact of the mass local vaccinations. And uh, to, to proceed from where Anna ended, we say that we are in Tanzania, the number of people who are dying from rabies annually. It ranges from 100 to 72 to from 172 to approximately 2,000 people each year. And uh, when he talked to, to Pemba, Pemba rabies was first detected in the late 1990s, and uh, this was in 1997. It's when a domestic drug was okay. Before that, they were they, the veterinarians had never received any case related to rabies. But when they saw this case happen, they never knew what was going on, but they were able to collect the sample. They took it to the National Laboratory in, under the Ministry of Livestock and Dar es Salaam, and it was tested positive. And from there, the infection start, went on spreading across the entire island, and uh, people were dying, though there are no official reports most of the years. And uh, there were no any mass vaccination or there were no any control efforts which was being conducted by then. And then in 2009, 2010, the World Animal Protection, and uh, this was formerly known as the World Society for Protection of Animals, they came to Zanzibar and specifically they were vaccinating dogs both in Unguja and, uh, and Pemba. And uh, in that year of 2009, 2010, they were able to vaccinate 750 dogs. That was the first control effort conducted on the island of Zanzibar in 2009 after the World Society for Protection of Animals came in to control the disease. But in the same year, 2010, 2011, the government, through the World Health Organization, 
and uh, the Bill and the Melinda Gates Foundation introduced a rabies elimination demonstration program or demonstration project. And uh, this was implemented across southeastern Tanzania in five regions, but also to include the island of Pemba. This program had the three main components. The first one was mass dog vaccination. And the aim was to demonstrate that dog mutated rabies can be eliminated through mass dog vaccinations. And uh, this was successfully conducted annually from 2001, from 2011 to 2015 for five consecutive years. But also, the, the other component of this program was free post exposure prophylaxis provision. So the program was providing free post exposure, the, the anti-rabies vaccines to any person who was bitten by a domestic dog, whether the dog was suspected for rabies or not. Or if a person went to the hospital to seek treatment, that person was given the, the, was given the, the anti-rabies vaccines. But also they are in, we introduced all the surveillance program that was also part of the part of the project. So we, the, we introduced the, the a systematic correction of data, hospital bite data, and also the veterinarians on how to do them, on how to do the animal investigations, not to do the sample corrections. So all these three components went together as part of the RBC demonstration project, which was introduced and it's ran from 2011, 2015. And uh, the same was also, so it was being conducted on Pemba Island and also on Tanzania Island. And uh, good enough, I was part of the, as when the project was introduced, I was part of the project. So I started with it up to the time when it ended and I'm still proceeding doing the rabies control, both in Pemba and also on part of them and uh, also on Tanzania mainland. Now for, for the Pemba, because we, we there, there were these continuous mass dog vaccination programs which were being conducted, but also surveillance being conducted also, and also recording the number of people, the estimated collection of people who are seeking treatment after being bitten. And uh, in this paper, we wanted to know how the transmission of rabies is, was ongoing or is ongoing as mass dog vaccination program is being implemented. The aim is to know how this infection is driven to, to infection. But also we want, we want to see, to know where the sources of incursions, where these rabies cases which are being reported on Pemba Island are coming from. Because Pemba, it's just a small island. Just a small island is surrounded by water. So if dogs have to, if dogs have to, for the dogs which are infected, or if whether they're infected or not infected, they have to be brought in by people. So we wanted to see if whether the rabies cases which we are which we were encountering in Pemba were they originally from Pemba or they had come from somewhere else, but also to determine the diversity of the viruses which we are secreting on the island of Pemba, and also to see how genetic data on rabies can inform different elimination programs you know, being used into the surveillance. So the data which we have for this presentation, we have the dog we use the dog registration records. Because we are vaccinating dogs, each time the dog were vaccinated, we normally register the number of dogs vaccinated into the special registration cards. But also we, apart from having that, so the dog registration records, this helps us to determine the dog population for each, either it could be the district or the villages where the mass dog vaccination campaign has been conducted. So we have that, we have those data, but also we have the dog vaccination campaigns data from 2011 to 2020. One thing which I forgot to mention is that after the Bill and the Melinda Gates project, after the government led project ended in 2015, the government took over, it, the government took over and then it started implementing the annual mass dog vaccination. But that was after we received an outbreak as we see later on. But so after each vaccination campaign, we normally do post-vaccination transect surveys because when we are vaccinating dogs, we normally either spray, mark them either using a spray to differentiate those dogs which have been vaccinated from those ones which have not been vaccinated, or at times we give them temporary colors, which let alone we do the transect surveys to help us determine the dog population but also not, they help us when we are determining the vaccination coverage. And uh, we have the hospital records, but also we do contact tracing. 
after we we go to the hospitals or the we use the hospital records which have been corrected we also have the surveillance we have the electronic surveillance system where the health workers who are within the hospitals after attending by the patients they normal they normally record the the data and they send them send the electronic data into the database which we have established so the database works at the same time with the hospital records. So we extract the data from the surveillance database and uh, compare the data which we have from the hospital records. And then from there, we get the names of the bite victims and their addresses. We start doing the contact tracing. We trace the bite victims and so we trace the owners of the animals which are infected. And then to see if we're told the people were bitten really by suspected rabid animals based on the clinical signs. In the story, the animal owners there, but also we collect samples using the veterinarians who are the veterinarians, the government employees, or stems from the community members doing contact tracing. And uh, we trace these cases until we reach a point where we can no longer find the animal which was like the source of infection to another animal. But because also we are collecting brain samples, we uh, the samples are let alone sequenced to for further for further analysis. And uh, recently, from 2018 to 2019, we started using the, the nanopore sequencing technique. And uh, we have used that to sequence the samples which we are collected on the island of Zanzibar. As you can see, for those people, uh, for, the, for the people who don't know the map of Tanzania, Zanzibar Island, Zanzibar Island, Zanzibar, uh, this is the map of Tanzania, and uh, the, the other, this is the island of this is the island of Pemba. It's not far from the mainland. It's about it's about seventy two miles or seventy kilometers less than it's less than seventy miles. And uh, the dog population on this island is very low. It's around three to four thousand domestic dogs. So if we are to invest in dog vaccination in this small island, it's, we can easily achieve elimination compared to the larger mainland part of Tanzania. And uh, I think it's, the, it's the, one of the reasons why we were more interested in, uh, in investing or in concentrating our efforts on the island of Pemba to demonstrate that if we have been able to achieve elimination on the island of Pemba, we can also achieve the same on Maynard so long as we, we commit our resources to rabies control and uh, elimination. And, uh, uh, and uh, if we go through the results, when we remember, <clears throat> The rabies control and prevention activities started in 2010 in Zanzibar. And uh, when the program started, we were part of the program and we have, continued, we have continued monitoring and doing rabies control up to now. We are still following up, we are still implementing mass drug vaccination programs on the island of Pemba. But also we have an active system of rabies surveillance, which includes contact tracing and the integrated debate case management. So if we go through the, the, the graph on the, the time series graph, the first one on top, in 2010, when no mass dog vaccination, when, the, when no mass dog vaccination was conducted, the, 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 the program, the drug, the number of drugs which are vaccinated were very little, and I, I did not include the numbers into this statistics. I just used the data from the government ready project where we started effectively vaccinating the, where we started having wide island, wide island mass drug vaccination programs from 2010. So in 2010, when this program had not started, the number of human rabies cases were around 88. At the same time, the number of human rabies exposures were 82. Those are the number of people recorded in 2000, the number of people and the, the, the number of animals recorded in 2010. But when the mass drug vaccination program started in 2011, we see that the number of human rabies exposures denoted by the blue line and the number of animal rabies cases denoted by the red line, they declined steadily up to 2014, up to May 2014. And, uh, and at the same time, the vaccination coverage, when we started implementing mass drug vaccination program, the vaccination coverage was very low. It was less than 15. And I think the reason behind it was that most people were not aware of the need to invest in mass dog vaccination program. The dog owners were, were less aware, were less knowledgeable, but also they were a 
free roaming. We couldn't capture them during the master vaccination program. But as time went on, we we improved it gradually. And uh, until 2014, the vaccination coverage which was achieved, it was around 51%. And uh, during this time, this is the, when the government led project ended. Because we implemented the mass public vaccination program for almost five years, but in 20, May 2014, the mass public vaccination program ended. And after the program ended, we did not do any mass dog vaccination program. We stayed for almost two and a half years until 2016. And in 2016, July, because of that long period without any mass dog vaccination program, we received an outbreak. There was an outbreak of rabies cases where more than where we received an outbreak of rabies cases where around one the, where during this outbreak of 2016, 2017, we recorded around 102 animal rabies cases and more than 180 human people were exposed to, to rabies. And uh, in 2017, three people died of rabies. And uh, this is the time when the government saw the need of investing in mass vaccination program. And uh, as I said earlier, between 2001 and 2014, post-exposure prophylaxis was provided free of charge was provided free of charge. But if at all these free human vaccines were not available, then the exposed patients had to buy the drugs from the private suppliers at a very high cost, where most of the people could not achieve. So the same applied in 2000, uh, 2017 during the outbreak. During this outbreak, there are frequent shortages of post-exposure prophylaxis. And uh, because the government had not had not thought of storing, stocking enough vaccines for the people who may be bitten by this by by, by lovely dogs, because after this period, when the government saw that there are no, there weren't so many animal rabies cases, it's like a, it's like a, it relaxed also. But during the outbreak, that was like an, an alert that okay, we needed to invest in the mass dog vaccination program. So after a certain number of people dying, after three people dying, then the government decided to invest in mass dog vaccination using its own resources to make sure that they vaccinate mass dog vaccination program from 2016. And the after, since then, the program of vaccinating dogs has been made routine by the government. But also the government made sure that they have post-exposure prophylaxis is left available for any person who is bitten. Whether it is a suspected lab dog, it's a normal healthy dog, a person has to get post-exposure prophylaxis. It's listened to introduce the integrated bite case management, where we recommend post-exposure prophylaxis to be provided based on the clinical signs the animal presents or the animal history or during the animal investigation so that we don't waste a lot of human post-exposure prophylaxis going to people who do not qualify for these vaccines. And uh, what we see after this outbreak, after vaccinating dogs, after the 26, 2017 outbreak, the number of human rabies exposures and also the number of uh, the, the number of animal rabies cases, they declined. They declined, and this was the result of mass dog vaccination. And uh, it was in October 2018 where we had our last animal rabies case and also our last person who came to the hospital seeking treatment after being bitten by an animal which we suspected was rabies positive. And after then, we haven't received any rabies case up now. So it's almost three years which have passed without any person coming to the hospital to seek treatment, either being bitten by a, a known or an unknown animal which is suspected for rabies or the veterinarians, despite of their active investigation, animal investigations coming across a case which they think is rabies positive. But so during this time, we were able to collect the samples which we later on sequenced. As you can see on the map, the maps we have the lady dogs and the blue dogs, which also correspond to the number of human, the human, human exposures, but also the, the, but also the animal rabies cases and the distribution on how they are. You can see in 2017, in 2016, we had so many cases in 2017, and uh, this was the time of the rabies outbreak. In 2015, it's empty. We have no any human rabies exposure or any human rabies case because we had no any rabies case reported during that period. And uh, we haven't included the map of 2020 and 2021 because we don't have any 
animal rabies case or we don't have any human rabies exposures. And uh, we estimated the effective reproductive number, which stands for the number of secondary infections resulting from one infected individual. And as we understand, when the effective reproductive number is, is greater than one, it means that the infection is spreading there. There is sort of transmissions going on within the population. But if it's less than one, it means that the infection is being controlled. But for PEMBA, the effective reproductive number, it remained below one and it declined as mass dog vaccination was being conducted from 2011 to 2014. Why it went up to zero, it stayed up to zero until the time when we had the outbreak in 2016. And uh, during 2016, the effective the RE, it went below, it went above one, but later alone because of the intensive efforts mass dog vaccination program, it declined to 2018 where it has stayed up to zero. It has stayed to zero up to now. But also we wanted to see how the vaccination coverage is related to the animal rabies cases which are being reported per month. So in this, we categorized the vaccination coverage either as low, if it was between zero to 30, medium between 30 to, between 30 to, to 70, and, uh, and uh, if it was 70 and above, this was classified as high vaccination coverage in each world. And I saw that there were a significant relationship between the number of, the, between, the, between the vaccination coverage and the number of rabies cases. As vaccination coverage went on high, they had the vaccination coverage, the, the less the number of animal rabies cases which you are, which you are detecting per, per month. And uh, from the phylogenetic tree, we discovered that before 2016, before 2016, there were multiple incursions from mainland Tanzania. And uh, all of these different lineages which circulated on Pemba before 2016, before 2016 had been eliminated around when you look at the time clock, it was around 2014 when these cases were where the we 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 where where the, the these cases stopped this spreading on, on, on the island of Pemba. But in the late mid 2015, 20, 2016, 2017, that's the time when we had these introductions. And uh, the analysis from the genetic lineages, we see that these cases were all related to the, the ancestral route for these different lineages, which were introduced in 2017. They are related, their ancestral route is from the Tanzania mainland. So we see that these cases, which were introduced into Pemba, they corresponded to two transmission chains, and uh, these were from Tanzania mainland. And uh, if we see how these cases spread, on, on Tanzania mainland, they were introduced. So we saw so the first lineage was introduced in 2016, but also it came in 2016 and 2017 under the second lineages. So the two lineages were introduced into Pemba both in 2016 and 2017. And as they came to the island, they spread across the, across the entire island. And, uh, but what we can say in a, to conclude from this small presentation that rabies was eliminated in twice from Pemba, both in 2014 and uh, 2018. And uh, we say that rabies was eliminated between 2014 and 2018 because the incubation period for rabies is varies from around one to, to almost, a, it can go up to six months or at times it may go up to a year. And uh, if at all there is any sort of infection circulating in the population within that period, it has to show up. So if it goes beyond one year to two years, then you may see that rabies has been, you can see that rabies was being controlled and from the data which are about it. Also, we need to say that rabies was, has been eliminated it was from 2018 up to now. They are, these are three years which have passed and we don't have one rabies case. So we can say with confidence that we have been able to eliminate rabies because of the mass dog vaccination program which has been which has been ongoing and that's still ongoing. And uh, we say so because we still, we, we, apart from the ongoing mass dog vaccination program, we have an active system of rabies surveillance, which is, ongoing, which is ongoing. But though we had these reintroductions, still the story from Pemba is a success. We can say that, okay, you can, oh, 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 oh. so any place for, for places like, Tanzania mainland or any other places on the on the continent of Africa, 
we for the past few years we haven't we haven't had where rabies has been eliminated so for us to say that rabies has been eliminated on november though we had these introductions it is still a success for us and uh, it showed that this can be done even in other places so long as you commit your resources but uh, we still pemba is still at a, a threat of having having incursions again because we are bordering tanzania and uh, the, the 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 places which you are very close to pemba we see that there is no any intervention no any intervention which is going on on the other side of tanzania mainland where most of the animals coming from tanzania mainland heading to pemba they are most of them they are non vaccinated or at times if they are if they you may request the vaccination status of these animals which are being imported and then you find that the information which is given is not in, it's not you know the correct information so pemba is still at a threat it's still at the threat of having it in productions and uh, this is a risk to of maintaining the current free status which we have but we still need to maintain a high vaccination coverage and also need to maintain a good surveillance system so that we are able to detect these cases are enough to minimize their spread and also to to control and uh and uh, also we are we are advocating now strengthening more border control to minimize introductions but also encouraging the counter the encouraging the government on the other side of tanzania mainland to invest more in mass drug vaccination program so that we don't have these introductions we don't have cases being transported by people from tanzania mainland going to, to them because if we don't control in Tanzania mainland, still we are facing Pemba at a very high risk. Not only Pemba, but also Unguja, which is another island part of Zanzibar, where they are still ongoing with the mass drug vaccination program and they still have rabies cases. But this they press, they press Pemba at a very high risk if at all they stop doing the mass drug vaccination program. So these are the kind of efforts which we are trying to to convey to the government, to the stakeholders, to scale up mass vaccination so that we keep Pemba free from, from rabies. And uh, this is the end of my presentation. But before that, uh, I, I wish to, to say special thanks to the project supervisors and the mentors and the government for allowing this, this research to be conducted, the government of Tanzania, the government of Zanzibar, but also the funders and uh, the and the and the communities which we are working in. Thank you so much also for the time. Thank you so much for the invite for me to share these findings. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy any time to provide more details on what we are doing, more specific on the integrated device case management, the one health approach which we are which we are doing probably next time when we have more time. But also I would like to share more of the findings on the on the reservoir dynamics of rabies because you have been also assessing the transmission the transmission of rabies between the different species where we are trying to determine the reservoir cost for rabies viruses because we have a lot of cases which we are which we are receiving from the wildlife specifically the jackals in southern tanzania and also we have a lot of cases from the domestic dogs so we are still if we, we 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 have results on what would be the source of rabies and uh, the extent of course species transmission between the two species. So that's another thing which I'd like to share with you maybe in the next year, in the near future, if time allows. Thank you so much. And that is the end of my presentation. Hey, wonderful. Thank you so much, Kennedy and Dr. Chuprana. These are wonderful presentations and so critical. Um, Really, and uh, I get excited when I, I hear you talking about potential jackal transmission in Tanzania, since that's consistent with what we might be finding in Ethiopia. But um, thank you so much again, though, for your wonderful presentations of this really critical work. It's so important to share this information and so much of what we're, you're doing in Tanzania can be applied to Ethiopia and other rabies affected countries. Um, I'd like to open it up now for questions from our audience. If you could please uh, add your questions to the Q&A box. And just a quick note that we did have a question about the, um, let's see, it was the death rates um, range between 172 to um, 1,958 individuals. 
And Dr. Chaprina noted that this is really uh, largely due to the surveillance um, issues that have been discussed. It's really difficult to get an exact number. Um, we have a lot of people not reporting and um, there's those issues there. And I can let um, Dr. Chaprina expand, um, but um, you have provided uh, an answer, a very, um, very well covered answer here. So um, is there anything else you wanted to add to that, I guess? Um, no, um, I, unless if, I don't know if Kennedy, if you wanted to add anything as to why, why do you, why do you uh, believe that we have this big um, range in terms of estimated uh, rabies cases in Tanzania? So anywhere from 172 to almost 2000 cases, um, I guess, what would be your take on, on this? I think one of the challenges which we have is that we have a lot of people who are dying from rabies and uh, these people, they never show up, they never come to the hospital. And uh, if we see the number of hospital patients, if we compare the number of people who are coming to the hospital to seek treatment after being exposed and uh, those number which, uh, which, which do not come to the hospital, the people who do not come to the hospital, there are so many. When we do contact the tracing, at times we come up with the people who died of rabies, but they never, they were never recorded anywhere. And at times when you go on investigating, trying to find out who that was really rabies, they will tell you that it was a different disease, but the neighbors, the people will tell that this was rabies. When you go to the hospital record to see the number of people who have died of rabies, you will find that the data which they have is very, very, very minimal. It's very, very, it's very few. For example, from the integrated device case management so far, which we have, if you see the number of patients, if you see the people who are being reported through the normal hospital procedures, if I can talk of the, if I can talk of the Serengeti, talk of Mala region where we have this the mass block the mass block program which is going on. The health workers or the veterinarians, they have recorded, they have recorded, I think they recorded eight cases of, uh, from 2008 to 2019. From 2008 up to now, up for the past three years, they have recorded eight cases, but through the contact tracing in the IBCM, for us, the data which we have on the confirmed animal rabies cases, they are 75. So if you rely on passive surveillance, the underestimation rate is very high. But when you have an active system of surveillance, that's when you get the true burden. So the range which we provide from 172 to approximately 2000, mm -hmm. that's based on the hospital data, based on the hospital data, excluding the active surveillance which we are now advocating. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's it's something that's just very difficult and you know to, to to estimate, especially when you're in, especially if you're in areas, yeah, with 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 limited surveillance overall. So, um, I see that there is a question in the was, question answer box. I was going to add another um, note to that last comment, yeah. Sorry. but no, yeah, thank you. Um, the one of the problems we also have in Ethiopia is we have the the health clinics. They might report a case, but they don't report it centrally, so it never gets registered in the national database. So I don't know if that's the similar, similar issue in Tanzania where it's being recorded somewhere, but it's not all being put together. Like you don't have a case number that you know, it's part of a system. It's not connected, yeah. something we're trying to work on. But um, yeah, so that's another issue we have in Ethiopia with the case numbers as well, which is probably, I'm, I'm guessing, an issue there as well. So, but yeah. Correct. So, yeah. yeah, it's the same. It's the same here. It's a, it's, it is a, a reportable disease, but right. again, in practice, especially if you're in a really, really remote area, um, it's mm -hmm. just, you may not have signal. Many hospitals, dispensaries don't have computers or access to, um, you know, internet or something like that, where they would even enter in they would have to do it once they get into town or something like right. that and, and you know a lot of these you know doctors nurses are really busy and so, so it's just it's hard sometimes 
for the, to, ca to capture all this data. Yeah. Right. And yeah, most of it is, uh, there's a lot of it handwritten. So we have paper-based formats that are being mailed and those are delayed and that sort of thing. So yeah, definitely um, an area to continue to work on. But um, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so we had a, a question. Um, and so sorry to interrupt, Anna. Um, so what are the benefits of using facial recognition as opposed to microchip identification for the vaccinated dogs? So this is a fantastic question. Um, and again, this kind of feeds into what are the ways that we can identify dogs that are vaccinated? And again, especially in areas where the, where the, the dogs may look very similar, right? Um, you know, previous, so, Microchips, obviously, microchips are the gold standard. Once that chip goes into a dog, it's it, that ID number is very is unique to that dog. And I mean, you have some you have very very small chance where you have have a chip failure, and that chip should be should be fine. However, a couple of different issues with that um, cost is one. Now, microchips. When when I was doing when I first started working here, um, about fourteen almost fifteen years ago. The cost of a microchip, the cheapest you could get was about five US dollars, five, seven US dollars per dog. Microchips have significantly decreased in price. You're now looking at about a dollar per chip or so if you if you buy in bulk. But still, that that is is still a big cost. Um, relatively speaking, when you're vaccinating, you know, thousands of dogs, ideally. Um, over a span of time, um, and you're you're trying to minimize your cost to say about a dollar to two dollars per dog. You know that additional dollar will it will de decrease the amount of dogs that you can vaccinate. So cost is one thing, and interestingly enough, the chips themselves are I mean they are again pricey, again cheap. If you're talking about vaccinating say a hundred dogs, not a big deal. If you're talking about vaccinating ten thousand, a hundred thousand dogs, that's a lot of money. But also the scanners, the scanners are, the scanners can range any, scanners are now starting to come down in price, but scanners can range anywhere from about $50, $60 to upwards of 500, 600 US dollars. So, and you obviously, if you're trying to cover a large area. So cost is one big thing. If you have an app that can run on a smartphone because smartphones are now, becoming increasingly available, even in, you know, the most um, remote places, right? Um, if you can have an app where you can, say, take a picture of a dog and enter it into a database and you can get that, to, get it to pull up whether or not that dog is vaccinated or you enter it in and then later the, the, the facial recognition can identify, okay, this, this many dogs we've have in our database already. So we have, this is the percentage of vaccinated dogs. Um, it is just, it's more cost-effective. Um, it's something that doesn't require additional, um, say per se training, because again, if, if you have a smartphone, you know how to take a picture. Um, and so it's, it's something that we see might be a little bit, um, might be a way to, might have a lot of applications in terms of rabies control. Um, you know, other methods of identifying dogs as, for, as being vaccinated uh, that have been used to vary with, with relatively good success um, in different campaigns have been, for example, ear tags or spray paint, collars also. Um, with collars, depending on the materials that you're using, um, you just have to be careful, particularly with puppies, because as puppies grow, if collars aren't adjusted or removed, um, it can be a choking hazard, but things like that can fall off, um, especially with a lot of, with the populations of dogs that we work with, which are free roaming, they're in the bush, they're, you know, they can easily get snagged, you know, same thing with ear tags, can get snagged on a um, twig or branch or whatnot and fall off. And spray paint or livestock paint or other things, um, again, also great method cheap because you can usually get livestock paint very easily even in pretty remote areas um, but it's there's a time factor there because um, if particularly if you're working in, in a place uh, for example that is that has seasonal rains if it's anywhere near rainy season that paint will you know dog you know dogs get wet they shake they rub and stuff like that that stuff comes off very easily and so 
you would be limited to doing um, a coverage assessment either that day that you did vaccination or very soon thereafter. So, so we're, we're looking at, yeah, we're, we're, it's, it's exciting. Again, we, we haven't fully examined, you know, all of the applications uh, that are possible with this, but we're very excited that um, as a tool to assess coverage, um, that this could be something that might be uh, effective and um, efficient um, and easily accessible to places where, for example, where you're really, you have to be really careful with your resources. Wonderful. And for me, hearing about the facial recognition technology is very exciting. We haven't implemented anything like that in Ethiopia that I know of. So that's that's really a big step forward. So I'm excited to see how that progresses and maybe apply in Ethiopia and other countries. Very, very exciting about that. Um, and so uh, again, please enter any questions in the Q&A box if you have them. I know we are running short on time. Um, I just had a quick little, couple quick points or questions. One was, um, you mentioned the mobile labs, and that's something we're interested in in Ethiopia as well. Um, and really trying to, to find the funding for that has been a bit of a challenge. Um, so what do you recommend for like getting something like that started other than getting a grant? But um, yeah, well, how did you guys, I guess, go about that? Uh, well, I actually, I actually cannot take credit for that at all. I have very little to do with this. <laughs> one, yeah. our, one of our colleagues in our lab, Kirsten Brunker, um, is uh, the one who developed this. And um, she's, um, I mean, it's, it's, I think probably the most costly thing on that, uh, with that Kennedy, if I'm not mistaken, would be the mint, having the mint ion, the, the sequence, the, the actual sequence um, sequencer that needs to, that that attaches to a laptop and having a high high powered enough laptop that can handle running um, all the data. Uh, we've actually what, what, what we also use for um, rabies testing are um, lateral flow test kits, and I actually have well, yeah, it's the, they they look like this. They're these rapid test kits. They're like um, oh, it's, it works like a pregnancy test. Where you, you know, where you can actually test for rabies in the field, um, and um, so we actually use these for um, real time, you know, rabies testing in the field um, as we get a rabies a suspected rabies case. But then we also collect samples for the uh, lab in a suitcase. Um, but I can put you in contact with Kirsten and Gurdeep um, and how they went ahead with developing that and. Um, yeah, that's, I don't know, if Kennedy, if you, if you have some more insight um, with that. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, I'm not the expert is definitely the, the expert there, Zalon, uh, actually in Ethiopia right yeah. now. So, uh, I'm, I guess I'm asking on his behalf as well. So, but um, no, that's wonderful. Um, Kennedy, did you have anything to add on that? Yeah, yeah, I, I wanted to say that the lab in the suit, the menion is sequencing everything has to do with the menion is sequencing technique. Kirsten has been working with the people from the Oxford who developed this technique. And uh, I think she could be the, she can be of much help if at all we need, it, we need one. But from what I know that the, the machine itself is cheap, it's less than it's around 1,000 US dollars. But the most expensive thing are the reagents. Okay. So the reagents yeah. are those ones which are a bit expensive, but otherwise it's good kind of be. I'm not a real person, but I was able to use the menion myself in the field. I was trained for very few days, and then I did the RNA extraction samples, and then we ran them to the the laptop, and then we had our sequence reads, which we let alone process the which we went on to the analysis. So I think this is very it's a good thing, but also as Anna said, we need to have the lab diagnostic testing because we can't go on sequencing samples, which we are not sure of. We need to test them in the field using the lapid diagnostic test, the lateral flow test, and they are very effective and efficient. And I think those ones, they are cheap and they are available. You can have them in the field. Yeah, 
Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, I can mm -hmm. send you I can send you links to where we get where we source our test kits from. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah. Getting getting them into the field is another is another challenge, especially okay. like during during pandemics when there's no flights and. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, usually someone has to get on a plane and carry them over. Usually, is that's how we've been yeah. doing that. So yeah, that'd, that'd be great. Um, and and then on just a brief mention, you mentioned monitoring and evaluation, which is a huge huge thing um, for for us right now as well. Um, and so definitely interesting to hear how you guys are trying to, to get some, some numbers around mm -hmm. vaccination. So that's, you know, that's really interesting and exciting to hear. Um, so last chance for questions from the audience. I, I know we're at time, so it's getting late for our speakers as well. But um, in the meantime, I can go ahead and announce that month's webinar on October 21st will be part of the 10 year anniversary for the Global One Health Initiative. Um, it will be a panel discussion on the future funding landscape of global public health. And we'll have sponsors from the National Institutes of Health, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, US CDC and Resolve to Save Lives. So we hope you can join us then. And that will be be 8.30 a.m. to 10 o'clock a.m. time slot, Eastern time. Um, and if we have no further questions, I think we can convene. And I wanna say special thanks again to Dr. Japrina and Kennedy for your wonderful presentations. Mm -hmm. This is really exciting to me personally, hearing about field work um, and rabies. So um, I'm really hoping to get more of this work started in other areas as well. Thank you so much. And with that, I think we can conclude. Well, thank you for having us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, have a good evening yeah. and a good day, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye. Take care. Bye-bye.